Kia ora tata. Um, so, as Judy said, my name's Simon Thrush, but really I stand here on behalf of um, all of the people involved in the Tipping Points project, which um, involves numerous students and researchers from Auckland and Canterbury and, and Waikato and Otago and Niwa and Cawthron. Um, so what I want to do really is, is talk about the nature of change. Um, often when we think about risks, we think about the, the stressors that we impose on um, natural ecosystems and we base our risk assessment around the stressors. Um, I want to try and shift the debate so we're starting to talk about um, changing what we do on the basis of um, how the ecosystem responds to change. So let me start by talking about one of the common ways that we set limits in our society. Um, and we do this as a way of avoiding risk. Um, so traveling at 99 kilometers an hour on the road is completely safe. Um, traveling at 115 kilometers an hour hours on the road is really dangerous. At least that's the last conversation I had with the traffic cop. Um, so it must be true, right? Um, they wear uniforms and everything. Um, so, you know, Limits are a very, very important um, way that we've ended up managing how we deal with risk. And as Kate alluded to in her talk, they do have some use, and I'm, I'm not knocking that. But let's just think for a moment about what's involved with that. First off, um, the assumption is we know where the limit is. Um, that's not always true. Um, we might be able to put some kind of buffers around or move a limit in a certain um, up or down a scale uh, to, to add some uh, precaution to that, but, but fundamentally we know where the limit is. And we're assuming that there's more or less some kind of monotonic trajectory that's going to get the system um, near the limit or stay below the limit or exceed the limit. Um, we, we use these policies particularly around the environment, um, essentially as set and forget policies. Um, we use them one stress at a time. So we set a limit on chlordane, we set a limit on a particular PCB, or on copper, or on sediment, or on how much fish can come out of the ocean, one stress at a time. Um, we tend to focus on you know, what we're going to extract or what we're going to pour into the environment as ways of thinking about those limits. The other thing that happens with these is we tend to think one size fits all. And as you will have heard over the last couple of days from many, many different speakers, the thing about EBM is it is a bespoke management action, um, so one size doesn't fit all. We certainly have some global limits that have been um, expanded by, by um, various groups, and this stuff comes from the Resilience Centre in Stockholm, um, which is showing you that we are exceeding our global capacity um, to load our aquatic environments with nitrogen. Um, but we might be thinking about setting limits at a, a national level, or we might be thinking about setting limits in um, a particular part of our coastline. OK, so we, we use limits a lot, but let's think about how ecosystems actually change. Now, the top one of those diagrams is essentially the way that I think we typically manage things. You know, the assumption is that there's a gradual change in the environment. Um, as we stress it up, um, it declines. We've got time to think about what's going on. We've got time to turn the taps off, and the system will bounce back. But as soon as we have um, these tipping point dynamics in the system, so these step trends, then the game rules really change. Um, all of the assumptions that we make about how we're dealing with the system and how it's changing, whether you happen to be um, anybody involved in this process, uh, they essentially go out the window. And that's especially true when you've got these small changes with big consequences because of this process that um, Candida talked about of, of hysteresis which basically means it's a lot harder to climb up the hill than it is to fall off of it. So one of the ways that we've been looking at um, trying to understand what's going on with um, the prevalence of tipping points and as a way of understanding the nature of change is, of course, with monitoring data. Um, and we can use this with hindsight. 
we can also use it with foresight. So the hindsight element of this is that, you know, if, if we are monitoring somewhere and we have sufficiently good data, we can understand when a change has happened and the place has gone past the tipping point. That might inform management about other places that are not yet that far down the line. Um, it allows us to think about precautionary thresholds that we might be putting around different kinds of locations. So all of those are valuable tools for management, particularly within an EBM context. There's also um, another suite of tools which are called early warning signals that we can look at that indicate some kind of change before the system goes through this rapid step change. And those can maybe forewarn of what's going on. Uh, there are people all around the world working on these, these issues and trying to understand um, from both a practical and a theoretical concept what's going on there. So as part of the Tipping Points project, we gathered together data from around New Zealand from as many possible sources as we could lay our hands on that allowed us to look at what kind of data do we have available. Um, this included fisheries data, it included estuarine monitoring data that's been supported by the councils and so forth. Um, and I have to say there is some exceedingly good data in New Zealand, um, really, really good stuff. But the overall conclusion from that analysis is that we really um, have not done a very good job of gathering long-term data about these incredibly important assets, our estuarine ecosystems, and how they're changing. The same goes for our coastal systems. So that said, we have been able to um, do some analysis with these things that I think is quite informative of change. Um, so one of the things we've been playing with is injecting changes into ecological time series and seeing how our ability to detect change over time uh, changes. And in this case, we've been looking at the ENSO cycle, major climatic event, um, something that's been going on for a while, but um, is, is pretty central to understanding climate change impacts. What you see here is that it's um, much more difficult for us to detect a tipping point under El Nino years than it is under La Nina years. Now, that's important because it opens up a whole bunch of questions for ecologists to start thinking about why might that be so, but it's also important in terms of thinking about risk and thinking about management. So what we've been able to try and do, looking at the, um, the state of the monitoring data resources that are available for New Zealand, is to try and come up with ways of how we can increase knowledge and certainty about um, when change is happening. That's really important because although it might seem realistic that we would take these um, very valuable assets and we would invest in them, we've yet to do that. And so we can improve the design of our monitoring programs, thinking about time scales and frequency of sampling and so forth. We can incorporate various kinds of knowledge to inform our understanding of change. We can inform use various kinds of co-variables that might be measured during the course of our sampling to, to help understand what's going on. And really importantly, we can start to bring experiments into play that really start to reveal how nature changes. And, and Candida and Nick talked about those kinds of studies. So what I've talked about so far is essentially thinking about um, stress and change in terms of one variable at a time. Um, all of that is important, and it's important to what I'm going to say now. But now I want to start talking about issues of multiple stresses and cumulative impacts. Um, you know, this is the straw that breaks the camel's back kind of stuff. Um, we can think about multiple stresses in terms of disturbance regimes, where we change the space or the frequency of disturbance. We can think about this where we're dealing with one particular stressor that has multiple ways in which it impacts a system. Um, so the illustration there comes from fishing. Or we can think about the interactions that go on between different kinds of stresses. All of those can be thought of within this multiple stress or cumulative effects framework. The important thing when we're thinking about these cumulative effects and risk is, is the way the different kinds of stresses add together. So let's just think about two really common stresses on our coastlines. Um, Excessive nutrients causing problems with hypoxia and eutrophication, um, too much of the natural capital running off the land and ending up in the coastal environment um, and smothering the seafloor. 
those two stresses can um, add together, and so the risk associated with them is, is simply additive. They can have antagonistic interactions, so they can kind of cancel each other out, or they can have synergistic interactions, in which case the two of them together has a much bigger effect than um, when they're apart. Now, that is what we see from most of our experimental research. So Candida talked about what we've been doing in soft sediments, um, and this is an illustration of that, essentially to bring out what's important about the cumulative effects in that. Um, so we have the, um, the shellfish playing important ecological roles in the sediment. Um, they are being impacted by stressors that decreases their ability to deliver those functional roles, which increases the effect that stressors have on the system. So we're in the snowball and cascading effect. And, and by the way, shellfish beds are the most stressed marine ecosystem. On the Rocky Reef, Nick talked about essentially these habitats being squeezed out, where you've got this interaction between urchins, which are pushing the kelps down as they graze them out, as a consequence of um, not enough predators eating the urchins, and sediments which are pushing the kelps up because they're making the water darker. So again, it's a, it's a cumulative problem. So those kinds of interactions between different kinds of effects get mediated through multiple ecosystem processes. They radically change risk profiles. That has important consequences for how we think about change and the way we're going to manage it. That's really critical in an EBM framework because we're really thinking about long-term, less certain, multiple use consequences. And it, it um, is essential that we think about multiple of the basic principles that underpin EBM, issues such as resilience, the fact that these are complex adaptive systems, how ecosystems respond to change, sustainability, ecosystem services and these social ecological systems are all part central of EBM and they're critical to understanding cumulative effects. The social stuff is really important here and as Kate alluded to, there's a, you know, a lot of effort has gone into a framework of how you might frame up a cumulative effects thing but the other really important thing is what you do once you start to be concerned about detecting change and we really need to be start thinking about our governance structures and how effective our governance structures are at being responsive and adaptive to the way the world is changing, particularly when um, the change can be a surprise. So what do we need to do? Um, essentially, as we start to engage with this cumulative effects framework, which as again, Kate said, nobody's cracked this anywhere in the world. Um, so that's a good challenge for us. Um, we do need better frameworks. We need to start incorporating connectivity. And, and I mean that not just in the sense of physical processes and the movement of populations, but actually ecosystem functions and services. We need to be getting much better at thinking about how ecosystems respond to stresses rather than just being pushed around by the stresses. And we need to start transforming the way we think about governance and management into a framework that acknowledges that surprise can happen. We can't just build the God model and be certain of the future. Um, and so we need to operationalize resilience and we need to enhance biodiversity. It's probably the best insurance we're going to get. And we need to be precautious in our approaches um, when we have uncertain consequences and take that really seriously. Thank you very much.